fantastic. All right, so this is a presentation on the ICU care of the liver patient. This will be uh, set up on my website, but this is uh, a review to the Southern Hills Gastroenterology Group and fellows specifically. It's really going to discuss also about transferring liver patients to and from the ICU and when to call, when to consider, or when to transfer to a liver transplant center. So there's a lot in here. It's going to focus you know, on advanced liver disease, complications, management. No really relevant disclosures in this space for me. And some rules and guidelines. First off, I always like to remind everybody that AST, ALT, ALKFOS, and GTT are not liver function tests. I still find many of my senior colleagues using the wrong terminology. So please join the current uh, nomenclature. And when you're talking about liver function, talk about bilirubin, most importantly, direct bilirubin. As GI liver specialists, you all should be fractionating any bilirubin that's greater than 0 0.7, diagnosing Gilbert if present, um, of course, you got to look at albumin, INR. Uh, definitely need to make sure you have thromboelastography on your fulminant patients or liver failure patients. If you don't have TAG, you have to remind me. We can start an initiative to get TAG into your hospital. That is the state of the art for coagulation assessment in a liver patient. Bicarbonate is a liver function test. Factor five, factor seven, short half-lives, <clears throat> and are quite useful in assessing for liver failure, liver function. I'll be talking about ammonia later, but my comment on ammonia testing, of course, is the people who order ammonia testing are often more confused than their patients. Liver function, child Turcotte Pew score, an old, old, old test, 40 years old, designed by a group of surgeons to assess who could or should or shouldn't undergo a portocaval or portal systemic shunt. And it still works to a certain level. You have to remember that child's A is broken down into A5 or A6. And there's different levels of A. If you're less than A5, uh, everything's normal, then that's great. If you're A5 or A6, you're starting to show liver failure, uh, then things are changing. And of course, as you get into child's B, you're um, only seven to nine points, so seven, eight, nine. And then once you're in child C, it's 10 to 15. When you have a cirrhotic patient in the hospital, you should be including their child's class in your consult note. And if it changes, update your daily progress notes. Same thing with MELD score. You need to have a MELD uh, in the chart, in my opinion, every day on patients who have liver failure, acute liver failure, or chronic liver failure. And of course, you'll have creatinine, INR, and bilirubin in their chart. Um, and we're not going to be doing too much on PEDS, but just wanted to bring up MELD. Sodium meld is the current standard, of course, and you have to be plugging in whether they're on dialysis or not. Creatinine, uh, of course, will go down to 0 0.7 and up to whatever value you enter. Bilirubin, notice normal from 0.3 to 1.9. That's to bogus, of course. Uh, ab anything above 0.7 for the bilirubin is abnormal, but of course, Gilbert is probably present in 10% of the population but nonetheless, you're gonna plug in the total bilirubin, INR also, and of course, sodium. If the MELD score is over 15, you need to call a transplant center. You are the hepatology consultants, but now over 15, this should say, call a transplant center for hepatology consult to discuss liver transplant. And if the MELD's over 25, they should be at a transplant center if they're a transplant candidate. Meld over 25, often they need to be in an ICU, so have a low threshold to move them into the ICU because these patients are tenuous, unstable, and can progress rapidly. And of course, you need to look at their meld trajectory. If it's 30, 28, 25, they're obviously getting better. Probably don't need to be in an ICU unless there's another indication. We're going to go into GI bleeding as the first major complication here. Can I ask a question? Sure. So um, I, I don't remember which journal I saw this in, but they were talking about including albumin and female sex in the MELD score. Is that something? There are many considerations about placing other, including diagnosis, the cause of liver disease in the MELD score. Those have not been embraced yet. They're trying not to make it too complicated. 
but they're also trying to make sure that the MELD score is uh, fair and there's not disadvantaged people such as women historically have been disadvantaged, African-American blacks have been disadvantaged. So you have to um, just watch the literature and see if it changes, but it's a very involved process to change the MELD score. The sodium MELD score took four years to include the sodium lots of discussions. There's a lot of transplant centers that live a life of paranoia and they don't want anything changed. They fight anything that, and they wave their hands and say donations will go down or um, costs will go up or something just so they maintain their liver transplant volume. So it's quite an interesting political environment, financially driven environment, um, but ultimately things are winning towards parity, um, towards fairness. So um, sit tight, but a great question. GI bleeding in general, the liver patient, the patient should be in the ICU, but of course, if it's getting worse, Dr. Gish, ICU, Dr. Stone has a question. Hey, Dr. Gish, it's Dr. Stone here. Greetings. How are you? I'm great, Christian. How are you doing? I'm great. I just, as long as you're here, I had a burning question, which was, what's the oldest person that's ever been uh, transplanted? I am going to guesstimate somewhere in the low 80s. I saw somebody in that age range at UCSF and at Pittsburgh. Um, I'm going to say somewhere between 82 and 84, but they were 82 going on 62. Right. So, there, yeah, so there's no specific age cutoff. It's just based on their overall health and so on. Right. So how long are they going to live? What comorbidities they have? What's their nutritional status? Do they have sarcopenia, frailty? There's a lot of yeah. code words that are coming into assessing these patients, but it wouldn't be fair to put an absolute age because you've seen people 55 who look like they're 90. Um, and those people are going to be turned down for a transplant. But great question, Christian. All right. Hey, happy new year. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for being on here and your great training and having me involved. Okay, so GI bleeding, just some simple issues here. Uh, if they've got ascites, do a paracentesis because you're going to put a GI bleeder on antibiotics, obviously. And I really want to emphasize this because I keep seeing patients who get admitted and the paracentesis is held till the next day. They're already on antibiotics and then the fluid's not sent for correct you know, data, including cultures and blood culture bottles. Um, but of course, antibiotics, systemic antibiotics are a critical part of managing a GI bleeding patient in uh, cirrhosis. Uh, I just want to highlight here, don't even look at the INR. If you're going to do a paracentesis, just do it. Don't look at the platelet count, just do it. Uh, Mayo Clinic had this one study with over a thousand patients, uh, didn't look at the coags and had, I think, two minor bleeding events done by a nurse practitioner or a PA. So coags don't matter for paracentesis, provided it's under ultrasound in the lower part of the abdomen, you know, and done correctly. A lot of information here about uh, things that you all know. So I'm not gonna go through every line item here because I have a lot of other things to discuss, but I think it's very important to put this data in the deck just so people have it on file. Most important thing on this slide is tip shunt. Remember the MELD score was developed to determine and replace the CTP score for shunts, in this case, a tip shunt. Now if the MELD's over 23 or the bilirubin's over three, of course, if it's over three, you're going to look at the direct bilirubin, but you should uh, discourage or not consider a tip shunt in those higher MELD or high bilirubin patients because they're at much higher risk for liver failure. And that MELD 23 is an absolute cutoff. A lot of people use 17 or 18 as a relative cutoff uh, before putting in a tip shunt. And as you know, we have a very low threshold to do tip shunts in GI bleeders today. There's a uh, you know, a lot of good prognostic data on using tip shunts and GI bleeders early, uh, less rebleeding, or um, often get out of the hospital faster, uh, just a, a lot of um, benefits for patients. I think tip shunts are fantastic, but they're a bridge because they overall don't uh, prolong survival. Beta blockers, of course, uh, I was very much against them for the longest period of time. I'm now kind of in this neutral zone where I use them selectively on patients. Uh, they do improve survival. They even have changes on ascites management or they affect nutritional status. It's kind of interesting about Nadolol and Propranolol, and I do prefer Nadolol. But there's contraindications such as heart failure or massive ascites or asthma or diabetes. 
uh, be very cautious about beta blocker use. Um, I'm a very aggressive about banding and very conservative about beta blockers. Just what variceal ligation looks like, not relevant to your team, but when I'm talking to medical students or other staff, sometimes they like to see these kind of pictures uh, of the banding process, but you all are experts at this, so I'm gonna move quickly. I think you all know that NG tubes are standard of care in GI bleeders, uh, but everyone still puts uh, fake news out that somehow these NG tubes are dangerous, they're gonna lacerate a varix, they're gonna knock off a band. Um, they'll, people come up with any reason not to put an NG tube in people. And of course, patients don't like them. Um, nobody wants something rammed down their nose, although we're all experts in the corona times at uh, nasal intubation, at least nasal swabbing. But these are part of managing patients. But Minnesota tubes, or Sangstock and Blakemore, uh, are rarely used. I was going to ask John and Christian if you've put one of these down in the last 10 years. The last one I put in was in a fellowship, and uh, we only used the gastric balloon. We didn't use the esophageal balloon. Right. Christian, when was the last one you saw? If he's Christian still there. Dr. Stone had to go do a, a banding, so so he's actually not oh. here. All right. A survey question. Uh, picture on tip shunts. I think you all are very familiar with these, but I like to have this in the deck. We're going to switch to ascites now. Hepatorenal syndrome has been an evolving term on how you define it, how you assess for this. But if you've got a creatinine that's increasing by more than 0.2 to 0.3 in a liver failure patient, hepatorenal syndrome needs to be in your differential diagnosis an indication for transfer to an ICU, an indication to call liver transplant center or transfer. We call this now AKI in cirrhosis. That's the global term. So you're going to start out with your first you know, statement in your chart note. This is acute kidney injury in a cirrhotic patient, and you're going to run through the differential. Is this pre-renal? You're going to volume resuscitate with electrolytes, with albumin, stop their diuretics, manage GI bleeding, stop or treat diarrhea, and I want to highlight the most important thing on this slide is something um, that is called hepatoadrenal syndrome. It's actually not on this slide, but we'll be discussing shortly that any patient with renal insufficiency or electrolyte abnormalities, you need to be thinking about adrenal status. You're going to take a good history on shock, blood pressure. Uh, you're going to do a UA for glomerular nephritis, interstitial nephritis. You're going to take a good medication history. You're going to have an uh, ultrasound of the kidneys in ureters and even consider an ultrasound of the bladder. It's a diagnosis of exclusion and you make this diagnosis after two consecutive days of diuretic withdrawal and plasma volume and expansion with one gram per kilo of body weight up to a maximum of 100 grams. Again, no shock, no nephrotoxic drugs and uh, your UA results that are listed here. A lot of information on this slide, which I'm not going to go into in detail, but this could easily be on boards. You're going to need to know what a PAMP is or a DAMP. You need to know that nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, endocannabinoids are involved in uh, portal hypertension, its management, its complications. There's a whole issue about the renin angiotensin system that's going on, um, arginine vasopressin. Uh, renal vasoconstriction is the ultimate pathway forward, uh, driven or managed by prostaglandins as well. If you take these kidneys out of a hepatorenal patient and put them into a normal patient for, say, a kidney transplant, the kidneys work normally. So this is a reversible disease up to about six weeks. And that is the timeline to six weeks when we talk about giving people combined liver kidney transplant in the setting of AKIHRS. So you've got a patient with progressive renal failure. Patient's been given albumin. Creatinine's now 2.5. Urine output is falling. Blood pressure has fallen to 80 systolic. MEL score, of course, is upgraded. You've called nephrology. And of course, in these patients, you should only be using CVVH. They should not be getting dialysis. Here, I want to highlight again this word I brought up before, hepatoadrenal syndrome. This involves getting a cortisol level, um, random morning, um, 
uh, cortisol binding globulin was the uh, free cortisol and then a cortisone stem test. But ultimately, hepatoadrenal is going to be diagnosed in a patient with a blood pressure systolic less than 90 who is either considered or on pressors after you give 80 of solucortef three times a day for three days. And if it fixes it, they probably were adrenal insufficient and needs to go in the chart. If it doesn't fix it, it's something else, such as uncontrolled sepsis or other inflammatory process that's taking place or just gross late um, liver failure. Uh, the big uh, issue now in hepatorenal syndrome is uh, do you use MOA or instead of octreotide, should you just go directly to norepi? And norepi is really now moving to the state of the art since we don't have terlipressin. So <clears throat> we have here albumin, yes, midodrin, yes, consider octreotide. Midodrin is part of that presser uh, support for blood pressure to improve systolic blood, blood pressure and MAPS. A little bit more here on albumin, uh, just mentioning midodrin, norepi. You never use dopamine in these patients. Uh, with the norepi short term, you probably don't need midodrin, but you can transition them to midodrin if you're moving them out of the ICU. You don't want to have them on a norepi drip. And terlipressin still is not FDA approved for very complex reasons. This is a study that was published at the International Liver Conference this year. Low baseline cortisols was really more important than a delta cortisol after cortis and stem test. But I like both tests to really help define where that patient's uh, adrenal status is. And there's some nice information here about acute liver failure, acute on chronic liver failure. And you can see um, a benefit in both patient groups if indeed their uh, baseline cortisol is low. There's a lot more data on this slide that you can look at with your team later. This might be really good for a journal club uh, when it gets published, uh, just because we need to really spread the word about cortisol and adrenal function, adrenal dysfunction in our uh, liver failure patients. Final data here, so I'm gonna just say, uh, take a look at this paper. Metadrin is an alpha-1 and adrenergic receptor blocker, and you can go up to 15 milligrams TID. Some pharmacists like TID as opposed to Q8. It's nice to have a little bit longer period in between the third and first dose. Uh, the first dose the next day uh, allows some vascular uh, recovery to take place. Octreotide, of course, is um, going to be given sub-Q in this setting, even though there is data on IV infusion. Octreotide is quite expensive. <clears throat> I don't know about a shortage in these corona times about octreotide. You might know more about that, but you could go up to 200 micrograms sub-Q three times a day. Terlipressin is still under review with the FDA. The reasoning is, is in the U.S. study that was going to lead to licensing a large number of patients develop pulmonary edema. But it looks like the pulmonary edema is not directly related to terlipressin because this had not been reported in other international studies or in the EMEA regulation. Uh, but <clears throat> it was a challenge, we believe, by interpreting the data in the study that patients were over-treated with albumin. So the rule I will give you on albumin is to use it to support renal function, people with SVP, people with AKI, HRS, don't go above an albumin total of 3.2. This is terlipressin plus albumin, better than midodrin octreotide, um, complete and partial response. Um, and you can see the complete response in pink that's here. Uh, and it was a very large number of people who could get a response in this randomized controlled study. Um, and it was definitely much better than MOA. So terlipressin, um, we think, is similar to norepi. Uh, the data on norepi head-to-head -head with terlipressin looks very similar, actually. Um, so it may end up being, because norepi is cheap, that may not even use terlipressin uh, if it gets approved in this country if norepi data keeps emerging to be so good. Uh, this is 90 days survival and these different groups according to response to treatment. And uh, the group uh, on the left is the terlipressin. If they responded, you get the black line. If they didn't respond, you get the red line about survival. 
Same thing in the Mediterranean octreotide, uh, get better response. I mean, they better survival if they have an initial early response. So it's nice to see what happens in that first, even, <clears throat> you know, one week what's happening to the renal response. And these are transplant free survival. So you could, you know, if you turn people around in the first, you know, seven days, they may not even need uh, a liver transplant. This is called the confirmed study is the study design of the study that did not get approval by the FDA for, for licensing. <clears throat> so you needed to get to a creatinine less than 1.5. They did hit that endpoint. Actually, it was statistically better in terlipressin, less renal replacement therapy, less liver transplant, um, and a serum creatinine at or above baseline at day four. So these are, um, oh, sorry, these are, events unless these things occurred, of course, primary endpoint is defined as two consecutive serum creatinine values less than 1.5. And here's terlipressin versus placebo. So twice the number of patients with a p-value, very statistically significant. This should have led to approval. As I mentioned, there were a large number of people on the terlipressin arm who developed pulmonary edema, but looks like they were overdosed with albumin and subsequently volume. There are some side effects, including GI, abdominal pain, nausea, and diarrhea that are higher than in placebo. So it does have a GI effect. Now, terlipressin versus norepi. Terlipressin's in black and noradrenaline or norepi's in pink. So in this study, 30 day, uh, terlipressin looks better. There are other um, uh, data coming out that shows that they look similar, uh, other studies. So uh, maybe a more formal head-to-head -head study the company Malincrot will need to do to keep their drug in the lead. So HRS is acute kidney injury that does not respond to volume resuscitation, and you've ruled out all these other types of diseases that could affect renal dysfunction. And terlipressin is better than other agents according to the data that I showed you today for renal uh, improvement, renal function improvement. Let's go back to ascites. We talked about that briefly before. And I wanna highlight that if you have hepatorenal syndrome, you have to have ascites. So if someone has renal failure and they don't have ascites, it's not hepatorenal syndrome. It's a required pair for this. Um, but how about transferring a patient with ascites to the ICU or a transplant center? Intractable ascites with hypoxemia, hepatic hydrothorax with hypoxemia, severe pain, can't manage pain on the ward or in a step down unit, a chest tubes in place. Um, and then you want, maybe you need to stabilize a patient before a tip shunt goes in. So, of course, if you have ascites, that ascites needs to be tapped. Every patient with ascites, an initial presentation needs to be tapped. And if somebody's had ascites for a month and no one's tapped the ascites, then you and your clinic would need to tap the ascites. Uh, and the ascites, when it's tapped, especially initially, you're going to put fluid in blood culture bottles at the bedside. You're going to get a cell count and differential. Uh, you're going to get an albumin and total protein, maybe some special testing as well. Oh, Paracentesis, no matter where, floor, ICU, ER, needs to be ultrasound guided. I use an ANC over 50 as an indication for antibiotics, but the boards will use the 250. And that was from a Bruce Runyon paper that was published almost 30, maybe 35 years ago, um, long time ago. So any, any ANC over 50, in my opinion, should lead to antibiotic administration. Special things to send. If you think someone's got pancreatic injury, you'll send an amylase. Um, there's a few times where cholesterol might be useful. Definitely a triglycerides if it's cloudy. If you think there's a bile leak, you'd get bilirubin. If you think there's cancer, you'd get cytology. There's an AFB risk. If there's a cocci or histo risk, you would consider getting those uh, smears or cultures. Albumin, everybody knows for SBP, is the standard of care. Um, and of course, antibiotics uh, for SBP are required that can start with intravenous, one of the cephalosporins, potentially zosin, 
and then you could switch them at day three, in my opinion, to um, uh, an oral agent such as Levaquin to consider finishing five to seven days. Usually the three days of antibiotics is probably enough, but it's nice to put a tail on that no dosing. Large volume paracentesis is similar to when we were talking about tips, but people have large amount of ascites. Yes, you can start with large volume paracentesis, but move to a tips as quickly as possible if they're not diuretic responsive. Up to four liters without albumin, anything over four liters, you need to be administering albumin and other things such as dextran or hespan should not be used. I don't even know if those are still available in the hospital. Um, Indwelling catheters were in style 20, 30 years ago. They went out of style because of infection and complications. They're coming back in style. There was an abstract at least being published on indwelling catheters and how they were useful for palliative care, especially for cancer patients. Um, very short lifespan, but for managing pain, shortness of breath, hypoxemia. TIP shunts are very effective for ascites. And the greatest thing about TIPS is it makes a patient move from being catabolic to anabolic, it changes their metabolic profile. We're not sure exactly why that does that, but ascites is re really leads to metabolic dysfunction. <clears throat> Splenorenal portocavil side to side, Denver, Levine shunts, haven't seen any of these, I don't think in the last 10 years, except one patient I saw recently, somebody put a Denver shunt and I don't even know where they found the Denver shunt, who makes them, how they buy them. But <clears throat> instead of putting any of these shunts in, you're gonna be putting in a tip shunt to manage them or moving them to transplant, moving them to a transplant center and managing them if they're difficult to manage on the floor, managing them in the ICU setting. Back to another picture about tips. We're going to switch now to acute liver failure. <clears throat> acute liver failure has multiple different definitions. It's kind of interesting. A fulminant hepatic failure means hepatic encephalopathy, encephalopathy within two weeks of jaundice. But what if you've got somebody who's got a high INR, high bilirubin, they've been sick for a month, but they have no encephalopathy? That's a great place to use the term acute liver failure. As soon as you put the word fulminant or subfulminant in, you are defining that as encephalopathy as part of their clinical presentation. Now, one thing that's important, if you've got acute liver failure, especially rapid onset, higher risk of cerebral edema, slower onset, lower risk, but they still need to be monitored for cerebral edema. I'm amazed on how many house staff, how many residents and fellows I've talked to who have no idea what an ophthalmoscope is. They said, oh yeah, I think I saw one of those as a medical student. Very easy to use, definitely ways to look at the, the retina, look at the optic nerve. Acute liver failure can be caused by all these different uh, uh, injuries. Uh, don't miss Wilson disease. I've seen that missed and be a disaster for the patient and a medical legal disaster. You get an acetaminophen level on every patient. doesn't matter what they've told you, what they've said they've taken, you just get a level, a standard of care. And same thing with blood alcohol. Uh, a lot of other things you're going to be looking at uh, in rare settings, such as if they've got big lymph nodes, you can look for Epstein-Barr. They've got skin lesions or vaginal or oral lesion, you'll be thinking about herpes. So you've got to really keep some, you know, ideas in mind about your physical history, laboratory testing. So <clears throat> this is another one about fulminant liver failure, another definition from Trey and Davidson where they four, six or eight weeks, they kept moving this around. I basically try to use the number four weeks, but they have, someone's got encephalopathy in two weeks, uh, if they're thinking fulminant or um, in a hyperfulminant, if it's more than eight weeks, I'd be thinking about subfulminant do a full physical exam. Fulminant liver failure, meld over 15, call the transplant center. Meld over 15, have them in the ICU. Have any encephalopathy, grade two encephalopathy. Those patients need to be considered for transplant and a low threshold to move to an ICU. Let's see, glucose is very important because these patients can become hypoglycemic and have seizures. Phosphorus is very important to get at least daily on any acute liver injury. And if their phosphorus is less than 2.5, aggressive intravenous phosphorus replacement. 
tag standard now, in my opinion, for managing these patients. Uh, let's see, we've talked about everything here. Uh, let's see, I, I give these people a lot of nutrients. They should be getting 2,500 to 3,000 calories a day. I really like tube feeds for these patients. Now, I always hear the nurse says the patient's eating. Fellow will tell me the patient's eating. The house staff will tell me the patient's eating. I go in the room, they've had a teaspoon of applesauce, half a piece of toast. Yeah, they're eating, but they're already 3,000 calories behind on that day. So acute liver failure, fulminant liver failure is a hyper catabolic state and patients can't keep up with it. Go back to the tube, you put the tube down, soft some anesthesia in the nose, but tell them this could save their life, save them from a transplant. Alpha protein is very useful in acute liver failure, fulminant liver failure. High AFP means they're regenerating. A low FP means terrible prognosis, not regenerating. I do like the King's College criteria to calculate the numbers, but here's some components that are useful. Get an arterial blood gas, check a pH. pH less than 7.3, bad things are happening to those patients. So I think this is a good place um, to get a, an ABG and look at the uh, pH. As I mentioned, every patient with acute liver injury needs an acetaminophen level. These patients can have ASTs and ALTs between five and 10,000. And any detectable APAP level is going to be considered uh, a flag um, uh, for the cause of their liver injury. But do the full workup, at least the first level workup that we talked about earlier. Any acute liver failure patient, I put on N-acetylcysteine IV for three days, then switch them to oral. Oral's one-tenth the cost of the intravenous preparation. Hmm. Transplant-free survival here for NAC across the hall, a variety of different patients with acute liver failure, not just acetaminophen. So I really like NAC. The only place that showed borderline results is in alcoholic hepatitis. Look at all the drugs that can cause acute liver failure. Every time you see something like this, you just go and do the reading and you do the best you can um, with assessing. It's basically a rule out diagnosis. I moved to encephalopathy. I mentioned ammonia testing is nearly worthless and it's uh, re urea cycle deficiency is really the only place where ammonia comes into play. And these people have ammonia levels typically over 300 they are reasonably functional, but could, can present in a coma if they have a lot of stress. So as we mentioned earlier, this is a reason to call a transfer center, grade two encephalopathy, make that call uh, for a liver transplant center if they're a transplant candidate. Most centers in the uh, West Coast are still requiring at least three to four months of sobriety before uh, even evaluating a patient. This is the grading you need to be thinking about. People often use the word stage. I like the word grade much better. I think it's more appropriate. So sleep pattern, memory, confusion, asterixis, coma, near coma, you're gonna be then be able to define their grade quite easily. Glutamate on the left side is a driving force uh, causing astrocyte swelling that uh, because of the high ammonia level, ammonia uh, combines with glutamate, forms glutamine. Um, and then of course you can't have encephalopathy without inflammation. Nitric oxide is part of this, but there's nothing you can do about that per se. Inflammation, you can turn the gut around, um, give the patient probiotics, give the patient antibiotics, change their gut flora. Bob, do you, do you think ammonia has any prognostic value in these patients? There are papers that say it does if it's done arterial and it's processed correctly. And it's somewhat individualized because you have to look at the trajectory, which means you need to get at least two, probably three. So that's the simple answer, maybe. Okay. There are believers. This is brain edema. True cerebral edema only happens in acute liver failure. It doesn't see, it's not seen in cirrhosis. It's a diagram of the urea cycle. It's just nice to know this. This would be something to be useful when you're studying for your boards. Those enzymes in the lower left corner 
<clears throat> are the five different enzymes that can be deficient and cause hyperammonemia. There is inner organ trafficking of ammonia. And the highlight here is, is that when patients have low lean muscle mass, they are much less likely to clear ammonia. And that's why we have a bigger threshold, sorry, a lower threshold to put them on lactulose, uh, lower threshold to use rifaximin just to protect their GI tract, depending on what insult is coming uh, their direction next. Muscle, build muscle. We put in tip shunts early. Uh, we give our cirrhotic patients six snacks a day, not three meals. All cirrhotic should be snacking with high carb, high protein. So high protein, big red steak, constipation, we beat that with lactulose, but lactulose should just be used to have two or three bowel movements a day. Don't flood them with lactulose. Uh, change their volume status, change their electrolytes. I don't know much about this glutaminase, um, and, but I just can't comment on that directly. Big blood transfusion, uh, a lot of protein. And then a lot of times when you are doing the blood transfusions, there's something else that's changing with that patient's medical status that may make the encephalopathy worse. Okay, you definitely always need to fix the potassium and you always need to fix the sodium. If you don't fix the sodium, you will not fix the encephalopathy. Um, if they're dehydrated, they could be encephalopathic, but you don't want to over volume resuscitate. So be aggressive, but cautious. Make sure their arterial blood pressures are good. Uh, look for peripheral vascular disease that might uh, in some way predict what's going on in the hepatic artery. All right, neomycin, I never use. Rifaximin, I always use. Lactulose, I use half the time because a lot of these people um, are... You don't, you don't need to use that much lactulose unless they're constipated and they can go up to three, five bowel movements a day and become dehydrated and you can make their encephalopathy worse. Rifaximin right now is easy to get. I don't know if the prices come down or the insurance companies have just said yes, but does not require a pre-auth anymore. If I'm desperate, I'll buy sodium benzoate from chemical supply houses and feed that to my patients. It does buy pneumonia and does a lot of things with the urea cycle as does sodium phenyl acetate. Zinc supplements, I'm very strong believer in. I think it helps a lot, make the patient feel better, taste better, uh, does help in clearing the ammonia. So I think that's useful. And of course I believe strongly in uh, zinc supplements. I think they're very, very useful. Fix the sodium, get the sodium greater than 127. That's the pearl. A lot of information here on how to manage and improve hyponatremia. We don't use VAPTANs anymore. That's a long story. Um, for sleep, um, <clears throat> you got to think about uh, medications like trazodone. I really like that. Tramadol, lower doses can be used. Sedimentafin at two grams a day can be used. Compression devices for clot prevention can be used. Statins are very safe. You don't want to be using aminoglycosides, heparin, opioids, NSAIDs, benzodiazepines, or Ambien in somebody with cirrhosis. Hyponatremia, move slow, move upwards. You know, if you're at 119, you want to get over one, uh, 127, that may take three days, but don't go too fast. Otherwise, you'll get this central pontine myelinolysis, which now has new name, which I'm just working on. Really for sleep, uh, you want to avoid Ambien or use very low doses. I prefer Trazodone in my patients um, and uh, skin creams are useful. Sedimentafin, not so much for itching, but it's reasonably safe. And of course, compression devices because patients are at high risk for pulmonary embolus. This is data on the renin angiotensin system. And this is treatment with um, RAI or treating relative renal insufficiency. Um, but the, bo the bottom line is, is that the worse the adrenal function, the higher the mortality. And these patients may need to be in the ICU, but all is going to depend on blood pressure. We want to keep the MAPS over 70. In my opinion, the systolic consistently over 90. <clears throat> 
think we discussed everything on here. If they're a mystery, you're not sure, call for help. If they're acutely ill, you're not sure what's going on, call for help. And then you can consider help. Help syndrome is a cause of acute liver failure in pregnancy. That can be worked up through the right laboratory testing, through genetic testing, um, and to help you know, figure that out. And of course, delivery is important. Managing the low platelet count is important, which can persist or get worse after delivery, up to six weeks after delivery. And that's a wrap. <laughs>